celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. The episode today is entitled Spring Ahead, Snap Back. We're all used to hearing that phrase, spring ahead, fall back, and it relates to daylight savings time. Oops, daylight saving, no extra S there at the end, time which begins this year on Sunday, March 11th. It's kind of a consensus reality structure where we all agree that this will be the new time for the next many months. It's kind of fooling ourselves because we all really know what time it is. Maybe someday they're going to give that up. But at any rate, it's nice to have the days last longer or the daylight last longer. But you know, as an astrologer, I'm kind of a night person and I actually was born at night. And I love the stars. Who doesn't love the stars when you can see them? You have to get out of town usually. But we're going to have some really nice sky watching in March that I want to bring to your attention. And it involves Mercury. And this is really why I named the show Spring Ahead, Snap Back. Because Mercury is getting ready to do one of those back and forth retrograde is what we call it from the Latin for backward step. And this is a pretty regular phenomenon about every four months, um, well, there's a couple of clean months in between. Then we have a couple of months where it goes, Mercury goes into the degree range it's going to back up. Then it backs up. Then it comes out of that degree range. So it spends almost two months in a certain little slice of the zodiac. Now, normally, Mercury, which is nicknamed Quicksilver because it's so fast, goes speeding through a sign in about three weeks. But when it does one of these slowdowns and looks like it stands still, it's an optical illusion because what's happening is Mercury is coming between the Earth and the Sun. And you might know this from if you're at a stoplight and say you're the lead foot and the light turns green and there's a car next to you and you both start off but you're going faster, it looks like that slowpoke is going backwards. And that's similar to this optical illusion of retrograde. And it's really part of this dance that Mercury is doing as it goes around the sun, and we're also going around the sun, we're seeing Mercury swing out to one side of the sun and swing back, you know, disappears maybe behind the other side of the sun. and then swings out to the other side of the sun. Well, what it's also swinging is to the morning star, to the evening star. So we're going to be having Mercury as evening star, and it coincides with Venus as evening star, which also does the dance around the sun back and forth, but much more slowly than Mercury does. Mercury goes around the sun three times in an Earth year, and Venus, it's more like I don't know, three quarters of a year instead of a third of a year. Anyway, it, it has a cycle of about a year and a third or so that it goes through all of its phases. So it just so happens that this March we're going to have Mercury and Venus traveling together. They're actually going to be less than two out of the 360 degrees of the zodiac apart from March 1st to March 8th which is a whole week, which for you know Mercury being kind of quick, that's important. Their exact coming together called conjunction is on March 4th, and that is a great day. Now, it's always been one of my favorite days because I remember from a riddle book, what's the only day of the year that is a command? And the answer is March 4th. On March 4th this year, it's a four-rated day. You know, in my Janet's Planets, astrology calendars, I rate all the days one icky through five magnificent. Oh, there's like one five in all of 2018. So a four day is really good. And it happens to be one of the few days on my best and worst planets list, or best and worst days according to the planets list, for starting a new venture. So if there's something new that you want to kick off with a lot of growth power, that is going to be a key time for you. Um, now, you know what, as I say that, I am thinking the following, though. Because your maximum growth power is during that waxing of the moon between a new moon and a full moon. And we have a full moon March 1st and a full moon March 31st, the new moon being on the 17th on St. Patty's Day. And I'm going to mention a little more about all those things. 
but that new venture day, it's just a little bit past the full moon. It still has a lot of fullness to it. It's probably actually a much better day for a subsequent step in something that's already ongoing that you want to have help to blossom even more. But anyway, March 4th, good day. And we have this Mercury and Venus traveling close together. And if you go out and look westward after sunset in the same part of the sky where the sun just set and it starts to get twilight, you can probably already see Venus because it's very bright. And it's going to be evening star for like seven months. And sometimes it is so bright. People think it's the headlight of an oncoming plane, but it's Venus. Now, why is it so bright? Well, it's got a lot of gas and ice, and it reflects the sun's light very well. And it's the closest planet to Earth. So we see it as very bright. Mercury, very small. I won't say it's dim, but it's nowhere near as bright or easy to see as all of the other visible planets. You know, Jupiter's biggest, easy to spot. Saturn, big, easy to spot. Mars, red, easy to spot. Mercury, you hardly ever see it. So get to a really good vantage point with a nice, clear western view, and you can look, to find Venus, and then very close to Venus, you're going to see much smaller, not as bright, little Mercury. It's still pretty bright, but it's so little. And a really good day to try to see him is going to be the 18th, because the moon is going to be there. I said the new moon is the 17th. You know, cultures that have a lunar calendar, they usually really start their month on the day after the official full moon. And that's because, well, back before people were literate and had calendars and things like that, they didn't really know when the new moon was until they could see it. And you don't see it on the day that it's new because it's too close to the sun. You have to get a planet about 15 degrees away from the sun in order to get out of the beams of the sun so you can see it. So on the second day of the moon cycle, or one day after the new moon, you see that little teeny fingernail sliver moon. So go look on the 18th if the weather cooperates and find the moon, you'll find Venus, you'll see Mercury next to it. But you can actually see Mercury and Venus anytime, probably um, from around 28th of February, 1st of March, up to around the 22nd or 23rd of March. You'll see Mercury and Venus you're going to see for a long, long, long time. And there on the 18th, real good time to look for it is somewhere out 7.30, 8, you get it up to about 8.15. But depending on your horizon view, you know, a little earlier is better. Okay, so what does it mean, Janet? Oh, okay. Mercury, the mind, the mouth, Venus, the heart, love, harmony, peace. So we're thinking about fairness. We're speaking more diplomatically or sweetly, or we're focused on what our values are about. But they're together in, well, let's see, they start off, they're together in Pisces. Pisces is not a real, let's do something kind of sign. It's more like, oh, whatever, this is what's happening. You know, it's an acceptance sign. And when they get together that first time, right around, was it March 4th, I said yes, they're uh, about a degree or less away from this character Chiron. Chiron, we don't give it planetary status. I actually wish we would. But it's known as the wounded healer. It's an asteroid between Saturn and Uranus. And it's kind of the go-between between between those two planets. Saturn is about established structure. And Uranus is sort of rebellion and do things your own way and not necessarily according to the rules. So Chiron's function is to help us to go beyond boundaries and do things in unique and new ways. That's sort of the plus side. The wounded healer side gives us the idea that, oh yeah, there might be some kind of wounds that need to be healed. So you may find discussions a lot in early March about what's wrong and what we need to fix it. And in fact, with Chiron having been moving through Pisces for quite some time, and Chiron has an affinity about healing matters, like mythologically Chiron was the father of medicine, and Pisces is a sign about healing. And as Chiron has been going through Pisces these last decade or more, there's been more and more talk, especially the last year or two, about the opioid crisis and drug addiction, which goes very much with this sort of the wound of what would be medicine. First it tries to 
cure you, later it tries to kill you. So we need to make some kind of reversal about that. Maybe there's going to be a lot of discussions about that. Venus is also a money planet, so expect to see a lot of discussion or in your own life paying attention to things about money matters. And I don't know if I might have said this on my December show, which was the looking ahead to 2018, but because of this Mercury retrograde, which goes into that backwards um, degree range on March 9th, and it doesn't finish backing up until the 15th of April, which is income tax due. Well, you can take to, I think, the 17th or something to turn them in because of Patriot's Day. But at any rate, if you're smart, get your taxes done early, even before the 9th, if you can manage. But certainly, well before the 22nd of March, because that's the standstill day for Mercury. And when Mercury isn't going anywhere for a couple of days before and after that, it's kind of like... Hmm. We, we don't really have our heads screwed on right, so much better to not do your taxes under those conditions if you can help it. Okay, so let's see. What else do we want to talk about here? Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> so Mercury and Venus start off their closeness in Pisces, and that's very um, accepting and non-judgmental and, and very loving. When they both move into Aries, and that's on the same day because they're traveling so closely together. And that's going to be on, I think it is March 6th. Early in the morning for Mercury, it will be late at night Pacific time, if you're a Pacific time viewer of looking up through the internet. Or it'll be in the evening of uh, Eastern time for Venus to enter. But hardly ever do two planets enter the same sign on the same day together. And that zero Aries that they both come into, the first degree, is one of the four power degrees of the zodiac. It's where the sun travels through on the spring equinox. So those equinox and solstice degrees are really what bring action, big news events. So we may see some big news events around the 6th or 7th of um, March. And another thing that's going to be very big at a zero degree of a season-changing sign and I know we talked about this in December. Saturn went into its home sign of Capricorn, the winter sign, two days before the winter solstice, which is very rare. I only found like that happened mm, four times in a thousand years. I'm not sure just all what it means, but there's something important about this winter season for structures and governments and rules and things like that. So Mars, the ruler of Aries, the sign of spring, is going into Capricorn and going to go join Saturn there, but it is said to be exalted in Capricorn. That means it's a sign it works very well in. Well, Aries is like an impatient sign, and Mars, the ruler, is like, oh, things are done too fast. Saturn is determined, planner, you know, think first, act later. So that's why Mars is said to work so well in Capricorn, and that's going to maybe slow us down a little bit, make us a little more deliberative instead of all this racing ahead with the Mer Mercury and Venus in Aries. Now another thing to think about with Mercury going retrograde and all of that is in Aries, it's the impatient sign and it's the leap first and look afterwards and Mercury retrograde is already famous for what was I thinking? So very important for you to think before you act this March, before you go marching forth, okay? So on the 17th, Mars is going into Capricorn, and it happens to be the very same day as a new moon on St. Patty's Day. So this new moon is going to have a strong dose of sort of Mars energy, and the cycle that follows for those four weeks, very good time once Mercury's direct, which goes direct after the, oh no, huh, it doesn't go direct till, nope, never mind, not in that moon cycle. The day it goes direct on the 15th is the next new moon. Anyway, revise things, review things, rethink things. That's what a retrograde is good for, but try not to do it in haste. Ha ha ha, good luck. I shouldn't be so negative. Okay, so at that winter solstice, Mars and the Sun, I think, did I write down that they were square? 
Well, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. They're definitely square, meaning 90 degrees apart. Mm, no, I don't think they were. Um, 90 degrees apart is like at cross purposes. And that's the case at this spring equinox. And actually, Mars and the Sun are traveling less than 2 degrees from that 90 degrees, from the 19th of March to the 28th of March. That's another signal about be careful with your actions. Mm. There's the tendency to do things that aren't going to be in your own best interest. The Sun kind of represents self. And Mars is also a self-concerned sign. So what happens when you act against your own best interests? You usually get in trouble or have some kind of karmic payback that you have to do. OK, so we have another big deal thing going on in March. And this is involving two of the slower planets, or let's say medium speed. Jupiter, which takes 12 years to go around the zodiac, and Saturn, that takes about 29. They get together once every 20 years. And that cycle can be broken down into eighths, like we do with all the cycles. Well, you know, there's the half is like a full moon, and then they can cut into quarters, and then cut the quarters in half, and you got eighths. So an eighth starts with a 45 degree um, connection, half of that 90. And this is the final of the eight phases of the long cycle that started in 2000. So our next time that Jupiter passes Saturn will be 2020, like the end, or yeah, around the end, I think around the winter solstice. So when we see that they started their cycle in Taurus, ruled by Venus, and it's about material things, and it's about money matters, and I'm going to have more to say about that in the next show or two when I talk some about greed, but at any rate, there's lessons to be learned at this point in time about how do we regulate our taxes, distribution of monies, shared resources is what we call it under the auspices of Scorpio, which is the sign where Jupiter is traveling. Saturn is in the sign of institutions and establishment and status quo and kind of the powers that be. And so this is sort of a struggle to figure out how do we distribute? Well, how do we collect the monies? Who pays what? And how do we distribute the money? So there's going to be a lot about that going on. Their exact 45 degrees is on the 14th of March. And this is with Jupiter almost at a standstill because it's going backwards starting March 8th for about four or five months. So that's important. And when we're really going to see effects of that is going to be when Mercury connects to both of those. So it's connecting three times because of the back and forth. But the strongest hit is March 11th, only a few days after Jupiter's at that standstill, and a few days before they have their exact 45. The other two times are in April, and they aren't all in one day. But like Mercury connects to Jupiter, and a couple, three days later to Saturn, or vice versa. So it's April 5 to 8, April 19 to 25. But really look for something important around that 11th of March, or some news. Mercury a lot of times has to do with news. And Mars is connecting to both of them right at the end of March, around from the 30th of March to the 2nd of April. And the connections they're making are not the happy ones. Or let's say they're connecting to something that's already a stress aspect. So it's likely to have some stressy stuff going on around that time. Now Mars is doing a very nice thing with a third of the sky with Uranus. When those two don't get along, it's like accident potential. When they do get along, it's like aha moments, and this is what I should do, and insights into things, and just kind of instinctively knowing what needs to be done. And that's going to be very strong within five degrees of each other from the 2nd of March to the 20th of March. And gee, did I even see exactly what day is it? Um, I guess they're probably exact right around the 10th or 11th. Oh, again, 10th or 11th. I'm going to check that here in my calendar. Should have written that down. That could end up being a very big day. Mm, Mars, Uranus. Yes, that's the day, March 11th. Okay, so 
Mm. You know, International Women's Day is on the 8th of March, and that is a Friday. Don't be surprised if there isn't some kind, or maybe it's a Thursday. Anyway, I bet you that weekend, which Sunday of that weekend I think is the 11th, it's big time for a nice march like we had in uh, Washington. Yes, 10th, 11th, maybe there'll be something like that for the women. Now, here's another important factor. I talked about Chiron going through Pisces. I talked about the power of the first degree of Aries. There's a sort of complementary weakness to the last degree of Pisces. 29 to 30, there's 30 degrees in each sign. So they're kind of 29 degrees leading up to 30, which is really zero Aries. That is considered a degree of suffering or difficulty. And um, Chiron, which is slow, will go through there for several days at a time. So let's see, the first time is, come here, Chiron. Oh, yes, March 30th to April 17th. Now, that's three weeks almost. And it's going to come back later in the year and sometime next year, I think, as well. But because we have this going on, we're going to be looking out to see what might, I hate to say, tragically come up. Pisces rules oceans, and during this time of Chiron going through Pisces, we've become more and more aware of the real damage that's been going on to the oceans. You know, the plastic that's in them, the dying of the coral reefs, the heating up of the oceans. Um, and speaking of that, that also reminds me that, you know, storms are worse, like hurricanes or tsunamis, not tsunamis, the tsunami is due to the earthquake. Okay, hurricanes are worse because of the heat of the oceans. And we've been having Uranus go through Aries, a fire sign, and we've had hot, hotter and hottest years, year after year, in these seven years that Uranus has been going through Aries. Why I thought of the tsunami was just because the first day that Uranus went into Aries, well, the last day Uranus was in Pisces in 2011 was the day of the big earthquake off the coast of Japan that unleashed the tsunami, which on the first day that Uranus was in Aries was the fires at the Fukushima, or however you say that, nuclear plant, which has probably you know, irradiated all of us by now. But that's the power of that end of the zodiac, beginning of the zodiac degrees. So when Uranus went through there, we went, wow, that was something really big and major. And now here comes Chiron. It doesn't have quite the striking power of Uranus, but it has a wounding power. So we're going to watch out for that. Yep. And I just think we're probably going to have a very hot spring with this Uranus in Aries at the spring equinox chart with the last day of that. So speaking of the charts, I did kind of promise I would talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I had a phone message from my friend Mary. I call her the godmother of Janet's planets. She's a friend of mine since sixth grade, and she was the one who first suggested that I create an astrological calendar back in 2000. Anyway, she leaves me this message. Janet, I was just looking at the Farmer's Almanac, and there's no full moon in February. How can that be? And I said, well, it happens every so often because a moon cycle is about 29 and a half to 30 days long. And February is usually only 28 days long. So if you happen to have a full moon on the 31st of January, like we did, and another full moon coming up on the 1st of March, like we do, February gets left out, short February. It did have one new moon on the 15th, and that was an eclipse. And so that at least got a doozy. But we have come to call that second full moon in a calendar month a blue moon, and we spell it B-L-U-E. Like it might be the color blue, but it never will look blue. This is a mistake that a writer for an astronomy magazine made back around 1940, if my memory is correct. And the true definition of a blue moon, it's spelled B-E-L-E-W-E, -E -E, which is the ancient or old British word for betrayer. So all the full moons have a name, and there would be the name of the full moon in March, would usually be called 
the Lenten moon. And so you would start fasting for Easter because Easter is always the first full moon after that spring equinox or the Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So if you had, doesn't happen very often, in a three-month season, four full moons, they would say, oh, if we let that third one be the Lenten moon, we have to fast for another whole month before we get to Easter. So that was called the betrayer moon, and they stuck that in there, the blue moon, so that your Lenten moon would come closer to the spring equinox and you wouldn't have to fast so long. So that's what a real blue moon is. But you'll hear everybody saying, oh, we have two blue moons this month. Well, yes, if you go by that mistake that was made almost a century ago. Well, not quite, but at any rate, in the modern period. So we have just a couple minutes left. I will say this. Our full moon at the 1st of March is kind of nice. It has that Venus and Mercury close together, and they're in a nice connection with Jupiter. So there's optimism. It feels kind of good. By the time we get to that um, new moon on St. Patty's Day, the sun and the moon are both in that 90 degrees to Mars, which has just come into its power at the, one of the degrees that affects far and wide, those solstice and equinox degrees. And that's going to be kind of hairy. And I think it's kind of funny that St. Patty's Day usually falls during Lent when a lot of people are supposed to give up drinking, but it's a really big drinking holiday. But there's the Irish for you. Okay, and I'm part Irish, I can say that. So we get to the second full moon on the 31st, and that's when we have that Chiron at the 29 Pisces. It's pretty heavy. We're in the midst of stuff with that, you know, Saturn and Jupiter. It's not such a nice new moon. So get your, you know, important things done early in March, because that's when the good times roll. And let's see. The spring equinox chart, it does have the Venus, Mercury still very close together. They are in Aries. There's a lot of Aries planets going on then. Thank God the moon's in Taurus going to give us a little patience. But I think it's going to be a hot spring with a lot of um, action and maybe a lot of, I don't know, discussions may be peaceful. We hope. And here's the last thing I just want to tell you because this is funny and we won't talk again until we're into April. But Easter is on April Fool's Day and that's no joke. One more thing before we go. I wanted to make sure I mentioned to you the Janet's Planets 2018 ebook. It's still available. There's a lot of the year left. It discusses things like these retrogrades. And you can also always get from my website the free download of the 2018 on a page that shows when all the retrogrades are and when the moons and you know new and full and all of that stuff. So this is exciting. We're going to talk more about this on future episodes of Looking Up.